Okay, today we're going to be talking about how you can use exercise and activity in relation to helping manage symptoms in your neck. So we'll be talking about various forms of activity, specifically virtual body exercises is something we're going to detail at the end of the um, presentation. We're going to be building on the breathing exercises that were introduced um, in the pacing and breathing class, but primarily achieving each of your breaths using your diaphragm rather than your accessory muscles up in your neck and shoulders. Um, other content that we're going to be going through today could be termed as stability exercises. So they're muscle activation exercises, motor control exercises. Make sure you're getting the right muscles doing the right work, specifically in how you're getting stability through your center up in your neck and shoulder region. We're also going to talk about exercises that are range of motion mobility exercises, so dental stretching, and how that works in conjunction with um, the muscle activation exercises to help reduce your symptoms. And then recognizing that the research still very clearly shows um, that at this stage, there is no single best exercise um, for persistent pain, but that you need to keep moving. So we'll just talk briefly about posture. Um, primarily that the thinking around posture is changing a little bit. We're getting away from the idea of good posture and bad posture, and we're just recognizing that our bodies are meant to move. Now that said, there's still that concept of ideal alignment demonstrated on the left-hand side, which is just actually the most efficient, most effective way to hold our body. So we're always sending and receiving instructions of how to hold our body and then potentially create movement of our body through space. And the left-hand side one, that image A, is the most efficient way to be doing that. What makes it efficient, it has all the muscles. We have mover muscles as well as stabilizer muscles. It has them in their good resting length so that it can effectively do their work. So if you think about a structure like your bicep muscle that bends your elbow, it goes across your elbow and up to the tip of your shoulder. When your elbow is completely straight, when your bicep is lengthened, it's hard to get uh, activation. It's hard to start picking something up. And then as you bend your elbow and get that muscle into its mid length, it's better at generating forces and strength. And then as you continue to bend your elbow and you shorten the muscle further still, it's not nearly as effective. So highlighting that that mid range, that mid length is where the muscles do their best work. And in that uh, A posture is how you are holding yourself so that the muscles, particularly the stabilizing system in your neck and shoulders, and then in your low back and pelvis are able to do their work effectively. And then when your brain sends instructions to create movement, that they're able to respond effectively. Now that said, we know if you're a people watcher at all, you know that there's lots of different ways that people hold their bodies and that there's nothing sinister about any of these other positions, either illustrated on this picture or other ways that you see people um, moving around through the world. It could just be less efficient. And then the question is, some people, the system overall, says that inefficiency, that muscle overwork is no big deal and they don't get symptoms. But for a lot of people putting themselves into that more inefficient position overworks muscles and in a sensitive system that overwork can really feel like pain triggers more protection and can kind of cascade um, into more increase in symptoms. So we don't go around looking to correct people's posture per se. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can hold your body and move your body that's perfectly safe. But if you're dealing with a sensitive system, a system that is um, struggling with persistent pain, then we may want to go back to the most effective neutral position, coaxing it slowly towards that if it's been into a different position for a long time and it's kind of home base is one of these other ones that's no longer not serving you but what it's used to. And we want to slowly start coaxing it into something different and this kind of more neutral posture would be a place that we're trying to move to. And we'll just talk more specifically about the anatomy in the neck or cervical spine region. Just to highlight that the primary job of um, the bones in this region, the vertebrae in this region, could be de described as there being the armor 
protecting your brainstem and your upper, upper spinal cord. So it's a very strong and robust structure, but it also could be viewed as a very sensitive structure. And what I mean by that is that it's an area that's very highly monitored. There's lots of receptors gathering information and relaying information about what's happening in those structures. Because if there is a change, then we're body, we want to know about it. But it also is like armor. It's very strong, robust. The changes don't significant changes don't happen that often. There may be things that would be parallel to, you know, a chip of paint off a uh, coat of armor or something like that. So little changes that you see, but have no functional consequences, but that we're very sensitive, we'll monitor it. And um, especially if you get to the point where you're really bombarding the central nervous system with information and it doesn't know what to make, it may be primed to go into protection mode to try and make more sense of it. And protection is creating pain. So protecting you, hindering you from doing certain things because it doesn't know if it's good or bad and if there's enough at stake because its job is to protect um, and armor the uh, spinal cord and brainstem, then that might be why we often see symptoms up into the neck and or throughout the spine. It's not that we're wearing these structures out, but that they are sensitive structures because their job is to protect these very important um, neurological structures. Now that said, moving to the middle picture, what I wanna highlight again of how strong and robust all of these structures are, we're talking about your vertebrae um, and how they are linked with your ligaments uh, whose primary job is to connect bone to bone, and then the discs in between. Um, again, what this does is this building, rather than having one hollow bone protecting all of these neurological structures, when you have them stacked on top of each other, it means that you can twist, turn your head, get more information about your environment, interact with your environment, and it seems to be that that's an advantage to have that set up, and we want to remind our body um, and our nervous system in particular, how we can move and use our head, turn at our neck um, to interact with our environment. And then the other piece to highlight from this is that the, there has been this bench study research looking at just how strong and robust these structures are. So what they've done is they've taken cadavers, they put four sensors into these various structures, the ligaments, the bones, the discs, and they've generated different forces um, through you know, kind of engineering type setups, testing setups, where they've created compression forces or shear forces or flexion forces, and really to test what the fail points are for these structures. And the good news is, even at a cadaver level, these structures can handle forces much higher than what you generate in your day-to-day -day activities. So what that means is, although there may be certain movements in what you're doing in your day that really send your pain and your protection through the roots, it is not likely at all a reflection of damage to those tissues, but more that it's a sensitive structure and that you're easily triggered into protection. So what we want to do is wind the system down, be less protective, and allow you to create more day-to-day -day movements that you can safely do without pain. So the piece that we then work on for that is one piece being that we get the right muscles doing the right work. So on the right hand side, thus illustrations of the deep muscles, the deep neck flexor muscles that are right beside the vertebrae. So they're behind the trachea, behind the esophagus, snug up right beside the vertebrae, and they act like guide wires, giving that very local stability. So anytime that you're going to create a movement, what has to happen is the brain sends instructions to get stability through your center to create movement from your limbs. So all those times when you're quiet, you have that stability of your head on your shoulders, these are the muscles that should be recruited to be doing that type of work. Now, this must, that's important is that these are endurance muscles. At a fiber and chemical level, they are quite happy to be firing all day long versus the mover muscles, either for turning your head or moving your arms that are also located in this region are structurally different and they need to fire and then relax and recover and fire and relax and recover. And when they're overworked, they get short, tight, tired, you end up with overworked symptoms as well as other symptoms of inefficiencies. And so what we really want to start doing to help manage those symptoms so then you can translate into whole body movements is getting your stability in the right way, which involves reminding your brain how to talk to these structures and how to get these structures to respond effectively.
Next, we're going to talk about how um, complex symptoms in your neck can be. And just looking on the left-hand side, seeing how it can get into a little bit of a cycle. Um, first, taking a look at the deep neck flexors and how they can be weakened. So they can be weakened simply from a mechanics perspective of if you've got your head forward and they're at their end range fully lengthened, they're not nearly as strong as effective as when they're in their mid range. And also when you've got your head forward, you're no longer stocking your head over your shoulders. So gravity has um, a greater influence and in requiring them to do more work. So that's where things can get a bit challenging from that side of things. It may also be that if you were it, if your symptoms started off by some sort of injury, some sort of whiplash injury um, that may have also injured uh, the structures in your neck, um, that injury would have healed uh, for sure within six weeks, maybe even up to eight weeks. But you have that you may have that residual effect where it's not as effective at doing its work. And so it's weak from that perspective, but absolutely can be retrained, strengthened, just like any other muscle in your body. But also look how things start playing off of each other. When you're in that more forward position, then the muscles, the pectoral group in the front there can start getting tight as well. And when you move to the back, the scapular stabilizers, so the ones that are meant to stabilize your shoulder blade, um, get weakened. But again, simply because of the mechanics of where they're being put, they're being fully lengthened and are not able to do their work as effectively. And then finally, the other player from a muscular perspective is overactive traps and levator scapulae. So muscles that are meant to move your arm being overworked, either trying to hold your head on your shoulders, trying to be involved in your breathing mechanics, or otherwise just being uninhibited from other parts of the system, um, not working optimally as well. So what we're really trying to do is reset this system and when it becomes a bit of a cycle, it can be that it becomes feeling a bit more daunting, but also the nice part is, is it means that we can try and access and create change at various points in the cycle. So if we try to do some work, say, um, with stretching your pecs and your body isn't responding very effectively with that, then we can start doing things more effectively, looking at your deep neck flexors or looking at a different point in the cycle and then always figuring out what needs to be done um, to move your treatments forward. So to start with, as a sensible starting point, we will start talking about how to get the right muscles doing the right work and how to get your brain tapping into those deep neck flexors. So as you can see on the right hand side, a little bit more close up, they're very, very deep structures. They're not structures you can actually feel from the outside. You can't touch to feel if they're working, but they are skeletal muscles like other muscles in your body. And what we're going to be doing actually is if we get into a position and all the muscles in your neck and your shoulders are staying quiet, then we are assuming that the deeper structures are the ones that have kind of stepped up and started doing their work so that the other ones aren't being overloaded. So one way to really start um, shifting the pattern of overuse is tapping into your breathing and looking at your breathing pattern. So reviewing and making sure that you're taking that effective diaphragmatic breath. So your diaphragm is your one of your primary respiratory muscles and it fully kind of expects to be working for every breath of your life. What that means is the fibers are set up from a chemical side, from a um, local histiology side, that they can work over and over and over, firing every single breath that you take every minute of your life without getting short, tight, tired, any resistance from that. So just a refresher around breathing. So to take a breath, what has to happen is the air is going to flow from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So to drop the pressure in your lungs, you need to increase the volume of your lungs. So make the triangle shapes bigger. And the two broad ways that you can do that is either move your diaphragm down to increase the size of the triangles from the bases or use muscles attached to the upper part of your rib cage whose primary job is to turn your head or move your arms use those structures recruit those structures to lift your rib cage kind of up and out for each breath now both strategies will create enough change to draw enough air in so that you can get enough oxygen exchange to continue on with what you're trying to do however using the diaphragmatic strategy is far more effective, far more efficient, and it also reduces the load, reduces the work demands on those shoulder, the most muscles up in your shoulder and neck region who are otherwise being asked to move your head, 
or move your arms, whenever those instructions come up, but also to be firing every single breath of your day. And so if you think about it from a normal muscular perspective, those muscles start getting short and tight and tired, just as it would happen if you walked into the gym and saw the leg press machine and did 5,000 leg presses and then tried to walk upstairs the next day. You wouldn't have damaged your quads or your hamstrings or any other, your glutes, any structures. You wouldn't have done actual harm, but you certainly would have maxed them out from a chemistry side. They would let you know that they're tired. They wouldn't work very efficiently. And that's the scenario that you may be um, putting your structures up in your neck and your shoulders into if you are asking them to engage with every breath when they should really be getting periods of rest. So when you're building from that breathing piece of things, we use that in conjunction with trying to get the right muscles doing the right work for that central stability. So if you're not activating your stabilizers, it's not that your structures are unstable, it's that your brain is sending instructions and asking other muscles to overwork to try and get that stability. So generally speaking, that ends up being mover muscles being asked to lock down to try and get local stability. What we really want to do with these exercises is reset the system, make sure the right muscles are doing the right work, the brain knows how to talk to the right muscles for that stability, and the muscles know how to respond. So in the handout that goes with um, this presentation, it starts with the least mechanical challenge, which is laying down. and positioning your head, so lifting and lengthening through the back of your neck so that your head is stacked over your shoulders and those kind of ribbon structures that are meant to stabilize are in their mid-range, their mid-length, so they can quietly do their work. And then from there, you work on taking those long, soft breaths, engaging your diaphragm. That in of itself, working on that in lying down, may be where you need to start and it may take weeks of practice to make sure that you're getting the right muscles doing your right work and that everyone else is relaxed. When you are laying there and you are still, that the only muscles that are changing are your diaphragm, pelvic floor, transverse abdominis, and all the muscles in your neck and shoulders are relaxed because your deep neck flexors, that dedicated stabilizing system, is quietly doing its work. Now, as a progression from that laying down, you have several options. You could either stay in that laying down position and make the instructions that are being sent a little bit more complicated, such that you try and work on getting that central stability with the right muscles doing the right work, and then adding a small arm movement so it's a more complex instructions and make sure that you can execute it that way and or you could transition and introduce a little bit more gravity because that's how we live our lives and do something like what's described at this first point of standing with your back against the wall and having it such that your feet are maybe 10 or 12 inches away from the wall, working your way up the chain, paying attention that your knees are soft that your pelvis is leaning against the wall because the wall is meant to be kind of reducing the amount of gravity, not telling you how tall to be. And then taking your ribs and stacking them over your pelvis. So if you tend to be forward folded, it's a little bit of a lift as if there's a kite string from your sternum, from your chest. If you tend to be trying to stand really, really tall and stand really flared, it'll actually feel like you're coming forward and down a little bit to try and get your ribs stacked over your pelvis. But that's the position that allows the stabilizers for your low back and pelvis, so the lower part of your spine, to work optimally, which then makes it easier up the chain to work optimally. When you change the position of your rib cage or optimize the position of your rib cage, your shoulders are going to follow as best they can. So if you're really tight in the front, I don't want you to work and pull your shoulders back. I want you to just stack your ribs over your shoulder blades or over your pelvis and let your shoulders follow suit. And then the last piece is to lift and lengthen through the back of your neck. Then from there, again, you're being still and trying to take that breath, engaging your diaphragm so that everything, the muscles in your neck and your upper chest stay completely relaxed. Your shoulders are staying down and relaxed 
and the move the there is no movement simply change in your diaphragm pelvic floor and transverse abdominis and that's how you're getting your breath so your upper chest is staying completely quiet the muscles in your neck are staying completely relaxed as you quietly breathe and then in that position as well when things are going very well very smoothly and you're able to get everything relaxed and only have that breathing system working effectively then you could add a bit of arm movement in that position and then the final option would be trying it seated so again a little bit of gravity but not full gravity if you've got a backrest as you change the seated position um, and come away from the backrest you're you're trying to control a lot more variables and so that would be a lot more of a complex instruction set that you're trying to practice so the way that I suggest that you use these options, these exercise options, is think of this like your spine hygiene. So just like your dental hygiene, you brush your teeth every day, whether you have cavities or not. So this is the piece you do in the background as a maintenance every day, forever and ever, just taking two minutes of your day, maybe even less, once or twice a day just to remind your brain how to talk to the stabilizing system in your body and remind the stabilizing system how to respond okay it's kind of a primer it's just a way to keep the motor control working optimally okay and as you get better at it as you can add more complexities to it you still just want to take the the instructions that are more complex that you can manage just practice those. So it's not that over time it starts taking 15 minutes of your day. You just pick the level of challenge that's right for your body on that day. And it's okay if it changes, ebbs and flows with your symptoms or other factors, but working at it over and over, reminding your body how to get the right muscles doing the right work to give you that central stability through your neck and shoulders so that then you can create movement mobility through the rest of your day. So then the next piece is mobility exercises, gentle stretching. Now, when I ask people if they've ever been given an exercise program for their symptoms and they say yes, and then I ask them to show me more often than not, remarkably more often than not, they'll show me a series of stretches. And I think the reason being is that perhaps it wasn't conveyed to them how all the different types of exercises fit together and also that the purpose of a stretch is to give better resting length to a muscle. So if you're always feeling tight and tense, then it's uh, reasonable to want to go to a gentle stretch to help release things. The difficulty is if you never introduce an exercise that resets why your muscles are getting short and tight in the first place, then you're gonna feel like you need to stretch every day, every hour, it's just gonna be kind of just on a hamster wheel. If you are consistent with doing the exercises described previously, where you get the right muscles doing the right work, you get the deep neck flexors giving you that stability and all the local mover muscles and the breathing from the diaphragm and all those local mover muscles are getting their break, then those mover muscles don't feel nearly as tight over time, which means that you can reasonably expect to wean off your stretches over time, okay? So the muscle activation, the motor control, getting the right muscles doing the right work, that's your spine hygiene, that's your, like you're brushing your teeth forever and ever and ever. And then the expectation is the way that you use your stretches may change over time. And the hope is that the reasonable expectation is that you'll have less tension through your muscles and you'll have a less of that need or that feel to do the stretch. So the two stretches that we often describe are ones that target those big mover muscles that often get asked to overwork, either in breathing and or in trying to stabilize your head um, and shoulders. So the first one is side flexion. So that's just bringing your ear towards your shoulder and you're creating length and space on the opposite side. And then perhaps doing the other side. Now that handouts, and the slides very specifically don't say how long to hold it for, 
because I want you to pay attention to your body. It's going to change from day to day and it's going to be different left to right about how many reps you can do and how long you can hold it for. The determinant is how the body is responding, how the muscles are responding. So if you go into a gentle stretch and you breathe through that stretch and the muscles relaxing and lengthening and it'll give you 20, 30, 40 seconds, but still cooperating, then you're okay to hold it there. And maybe then go to the other side and then maybe repeat. But then the next week you go to do the exact same movement and it starts resisting you, then you wanna back off a little bit. And if it's still resisting you, then you just leave it alone. You stop with that gentle stretch for that day, revisit it later or the next day. So that applies for all movements, all gentle stretches, because we are trying to get better resting length and we're also trying to teach the nervous system that certain movements and certain positions are okay, they're safe, they don't need that protection response. So range of motion is that turning your head. And that's one that can get restricted quite frequently. And so just looking at how you can be doing that. So you can practice that laying down, you can practice that in sitting with your head supported or not. The one little piece that can be quite helpful with this particular movement is we know that we're hardwired such that if I move my eyes, my brain anticipates that I'm gonna need more information. And so it anticipates that I'm gonna to want to turn my head. So as soon as I initiate a movement of my eyes, then the instructions get started to contract on one side of my neck and relax the opposite side so I can get a good head turn. Now, when I say hardwired, this is kind of a more fundamental level. This is below the cortical level, the conscious level, in that it's to my advantage that if I hear a sound and then turn my eyes and get information out of my peripheral vision, the sooner I can turn my head and get better information and decide if I need to run or just chill out um, in response to what's happening behind me, that is to my advantage. And therefore, we are fundamentally wired to be able to do that. It can be a very, very useful tool that if you get all seized up or feel super tight at some period in time, if you get yourself in that most relaxed, most comfortable state that you can be at that time, and then try with your eye movement to then leave prime for your head movement, you may very well find that you're able to reintroduce a little bit of movement through your head and neck. Now, this next few slides is just highlighting that if you spend a couple minutes every day doing that spine hygiene, so just that getting the right muscles doing the right work, and then complement it with whatever gentle stretches you feel like you need, um, you're not going to feel that different. If it doesn't translate to then how you're moving throughout your day, and that if we're not keeping in mind that we need to keep moving throughout the day, you're not going to feel that much different. So these are pieces to consider about how your day-to-day, -day, how your environments could be influencing your symptoms. So on the left hand side, just looking at car setup, whether you're driving or passengering, just thinking about where you are, how you're set up and what um, parameters can be changed. Can you change the tilt of the steering wheel? Can you change the setting of the seat? And just working with that, make sure it's as good as it can be. And also if you're on longer drives or longer times in that um, situation, that you change it up every once in a while. So if you can't actually physically get up and move around, then creating a little bit of change, a little bit of movement within that constrained environment can be helpful. The other pieces on the right hand side, just reminder about you know your workstation and all of these numbers I would take with a grain of salt nothing set in stone what I really want you to remember is though that you want to even if you're only in a workstation for a couple minutes you think I'll just pop in and do one little thing on the home computer but it's all at these difficult setup for somebody else it's worth taking the time to really optimize the the setup for you and the reason being is we don't want to be associate getting the nervous system associating with certain tasks or certain environment as being something you need to be protected from so taking the extra few seconds and adjusting the monitor maybe putting a, a book underneath it to change the height a little bit adjusting the chair seat whatever it is making it as good as it can be and then proceeding so that you're not um, putting another environment in other places kind of on the to be avoided list this is also just to highlight around eyes, eye exams and wearing your glasses. 
there's a twofold piece to this. So we will do all sorts of kind of unusual things with our head and our neck to try and get our vision system closer to our targets or our environment. And so wearing your glasses as they've been prescribed is a way to avoid that. You know, it, it adjusts what's coming into your eyes rather than you have to do funny things with getting your eyes into their position. And wearing the glasses is just that reminder that sometimes your prescription changes. Sometimes you need to be wearing reading glasses or it was an recommended as an option, that looking at making sure that you're following those recommendations um, to make it as easy as it possibly can be for you to interact with your environment. The last piece to highlight is that if you've had an injury and a mechanism of injury such that you may have had a concussion, which does not require that you had a loss of consciousness, if it's past two weeks since that injury and you're still getting headaches and dizziness and vision changes and other things, then it may be worth um, discussing with your family doctor those symptoms, considering whether you may have post-concussion syndrome, which is a cluster of symptoms that persist, can persist and make things very challenging. And vision is often involved because the processing of vision is quite complex. It involves a lots of different areas of your brain um, to take in the information and then process the information, make sense of what you're seeing. And so when you get a good jostle, um, quite often the vision system is disrupted. And if that might be the case, it's worth getting the right assessments and making sure that um, you consider whether or not what might be happening is something that needs some neurological retraining, some rehabilitation, because that absolutely is an option um, after those types of injuries. Now this is just to summarize or to highlight that even though I just spent a bunch of time giving rather specific exercises in relation to how to hold your body and then create that foundation to then move your body through space, it's because the research very clearly shows there's no single best exercise for persistent pain in the spine or pelvis, but that you need to keep moving. So this is progress from decades ago when people got put on bed rest or put into soft collars. We know that that doesn't serve us well, but we need to start building those stepping stones of how do we get effective movement patterns so that the nervous system allows for more variety in the movement patterns of what is acceptable, what doesn't need protection and a pain response. So the nice part about this list is, I know it's kind of just move is a bit of a vague answer, but it's the reflection of the research. The research very clearly says there's no single best exercise in that they have compared walking to yoga, to bike riding, to all these different whole body movements. And they all seem to be equally effective in improving symptoms. What seems to be the real difference is what works best for your particular body, your particular mechanics, and ultimately what you enjoy doing. So there's no evidence saying that Aquafit is the only way to get better from persistent pain. So I don't have to convince you to get into the pool three times a week. It is whatever you look forward to doing, whichever way you want to be moving your body and teaching your nervous system that the things that you want to be doing in your day to day are safe. There's no need for protection and allow you to get on with things. So this graded exposure is just that reminder. This is from that um, from the placing class, but it's also very, very relevant in particular in relation to things when you're trying to reintroduce movement or different activities and activations, especially in the cervical spine region. It seems to be such an incredibly sensitive structure that you need to go very, very slow and steady. Now it's not a vulnerable structure. It's very, very robust. The analogy of it being armor to protect those neurological structures is very appropriate, but it's sensitive, which means that you need to go very slow and steady to teach it that the window of tolerance of what is okay and what's not okay it needs to keep having that repetition of that positive experience that it was no big deal when you turned your head to the right a little bit or no big deal when you brought your head back just a little bit. So even though the exercises that I presented as a starting point are very, very gentle, I would strongly encourage that you do just one a day to start, see how your body responds, and then being very slow 
in your progression. So if you're working on a certain movement, that changing your positioning in the order of millimeters rather than thinking you need to do massive changes and double chins and all the rest of it. The body doesn't tend to respond that way and it's not that you're damaging structures, it's that the information, the signaling is just too new, too novel, doesn't know what to make of it, so it produces protection. So going very slow and steady, particular in relation to these exercises, is quite important for success. So if you were to overdo it, if you build yourself up over a couple months and you start doing you know, two sets of 10 for certain movement patterns, then and you flare yourself for one reason or another, then you remember to go way back, scale way back, do half of what you have been doing and slowly build yourself back up. Again, teaching the nervous system, you've heard it, you've said it's outside of its comfort zone, reminding yourself you will have not damaged tissues, but you need to increase the window of tolerance for that nervous system, slow and steady way. When you do that, the nerves become less sensitive and you're still moving, still doing, so the tissues are getting stronger. So from this list of virtual body exercises, breathing exercises, muscle activation stability exercises, range of motion exercises, and whole body movement, you have options that you can use on any day, no matter how flared or how well you're doing, there's something you can be doing to treat your nervous system. So some of these things are looking at how the nervous system interacts with the musculoskeletal system, and some of these are strictly nervous system exercises, like virtual body exercises. Virtual body exercises means that you do the activity in your mind's eye. You create that movement in your mind, but you don't actually let the instructions get sent down to the body to execute that movement. So you think about turning your head, but you don't actually do it. That is still working on the nervous system, retraining the nervous system, what is acceptable, what plans are okay, what activity plans are okay, and that is a very useful tool if you're prone to flares or otherwise unable to carry out some of your activities, that you can always use that one. So virtual body exercises and breathing exercises are your go-to under pretty much any circumstance, and then the other ones that give more complexity, more mechanics, more window of tolerance from the nervous system required, that's the stuff you're building up to. So if you work away at this and you find that your symptoms aren't changing as much as you would want to, but you give it a good two to three months of consistently trying to create change in your nervous system and how it's responding to this region, you may want to look at the low back pain um, class the content from that because that addresses that parallel system that stabilizing system elsewhere in the chain and sometimes the drivers of why everything is tight higher up in the neck are a strategy that you're using lower down through the chain and we want to actually reset that system instead so just something to bear in mind but you really want to give this we're trying to create change that needs to go in a slow and steady manner you want to be consistent with this for several months before you decide that you need to shift gears that's what we want to get through for today and hopefully that's helpful